Hello, hey yo, and welcome to Omnidog's Vault. And thank you for tuning in to our interview with creator Eric Powell, famous for The Goon, uh, my personal favorite hillbilly. Uh, he's uh, talking about today a book on Eddie Gein. We also know he's done big name. <laughs> And uh, I just found out about a book you did. I ordered it um, and then found out it had a predecessor, and that's Chimichanga. Right. What, um, let, since that, uh, these other books are pretty well known, mm -hmm. uh, what's Chimichanga about? It's a kid's book. Uh, I wanted to do something kind of um, lighthearted after uh, a, a long run on the goon. And uh, also, it's I, I believe uh, uh, it started out as an animation pitch. Mm. I was uh, I was asked to, to try to develop something that was kind of all ages. And I came up with this idea and it didn't go anywhere. But my two sons, who were pretty young at the time, I showed them some of the drawings and they of all the stuff I've done. It was that that they paid attention to you know it was like i would do a cover for incredible hulk or something like that and they could care less but it was this uh chimichanga thing that that they you know thought was hilarious uh so i thought you know i'm gonna make that into a comic because um if they think it's that great and they you know uh maybe there's something there so uh, I developed it, and just as a fun thing, like a, a kid's book. Um, so I'm uh, Chimichanga's coming to me. I just ordered it, but then I went on uh, Amazon and I saw that there was a, a Sorrow, the World's Worst Face. Was that yeah. the first book? No, that's the second book. With uh, oh, I wrote that one, and and uh, Stephanie Bashima did all of the art. She fully painted it. It's pretty great. Okay. Um, so what I'm getting with Chimichanga then um, is the first book in a hardcover. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I will be getting that and um, this uh, sorrow, the world's worst face. <laughs> um, and here is the Minister of Comics. How are you, Minister? I'm doing well. Hey, Eric. Sorry to be late. How's it going? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Uh, I should have talked about this first before we got the minister on because Eric had some interesting things to say about it. So, <laughs> minister, uh, um, um, this is a book that I recommended you not read of all his books. <laughs> that was this book, uh, and Eric was telling me how it came to be. Um, uh, would you, would you like to continue? Uh, we talked uh, about the fact that, um, uh, it is, um, well, what is it? <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, a book that came, uh, a hundred, just completely out of spite. That book was done. <laughs> uh, spite I was, nice. I was told that I couldn't put the word, uh, sodomy on the, the cover of a, a comic. And if I wanted, it got blown out of proportion. And they said, if I wanted to do it, it would have to be released in the adult catalog with the pornography. <laughs> so, you know, it was just, it was just an attempt to get me to not do the book. So rather than say, okay, I won't do it. I said, sure. Okay. I'm going to do it. We'll release it in the adult catalog. And since they put it in the adult catalog, I made it as bad as I possibly could. <laughs> uh, so that's where that book came from. And that's supposed very, to be an issue of the goon, right? It was supposed to be. Yeah. Is it ever going to be in the omnibus that you put no, out? No, no okay. it's, it's, it's a one shot deal. If, if you got it, you got it. If not, it's gone. <laughs> got it. So I have, yeah. I have all five omnis that you put out. I remember mm -hmm. you saying this was supposed to be this issue, but we had to put something else in there instead. Right. Got it. It did get released and it's, uh, <laughs> it's as bad as you would think. <laughs> and he, there's a, it, there's also Satan Sodomy Baby Two, right? I I found that less offensive than the first one. Still funny, <laughs> but it didn't quite offend me as much as the first one. Um, I wanted to uh, just first of all, I as much as I love the goon, and it, it's pro I would 
I would guess that that is that I would guess that's probably your most well-known uh, creation. I even have the action figures, um, <laughs> which are really well done. And Taylor just recently got into action figures and he's um, kind of jealous of them. Before, before I ask you about Hillbilly, are there any plans to reissue any goon action figures? Uh, I don't know about reissue, but we might do some new ones down the road. Ooh. Okay. Uh, I'm talking to some people about possibly uh, uh, doing something. So hopefully we'll have something new soon. Well, you have two people right here that would get <laughs> new ones. The day one purchase for me. Oh, awesome. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we both love the goon and... Um, uh, I was a, I'm attra attracted to your art at first, and then your writing is so um, just dr uh, the humor is so dry and crisp that that's what captures my attention. <laughs> and Hillbilly, um, I really sang the praises of this uh, in a collected editions group on Facebook that I was part of for a while. Thank you. Um, oh, sure. And I think, uh, well, I know I made a video of it. It's in, it's in my video catalog, my library. Um, I, I loved this book. Um, if it's possible, I loved it even more than, uh, the goon. And this is under your albatross, mm -hmm. your own label. Mm -hmm. Um, how, what are the, day-to-day -day operations like are you are you uh, really involved with that or um have you yeah <laughs> okay can you tell us a little bit about owning your own imprint well it, and we're we're a small independent publisher so it's not uh, a giant operation um uh andrea and i run it for the most part and then we uh have uh, freelance contributors that help us. Um, our editorial is is freelance and um, marketing for the most part. Uh, we do a lot of that ourselves, but we also, um, you know, hire some outside help from time to time. And then, you know, all of the artists other than myself are, are freelance. What are some titles that are coming out from Albatross that you're not personally writing or drawing, but you're really excited about? Uh, we don't really have uh, anything on the schedule right now uh, that I'm not involved with. Um, the uh, we have a book coming out called uh, that I'm writing with uh, Lucky Yates, who is the voice of Dr. Krieger. On um, uh, <laughs> I'm drawing a, I'm drawing a complete bank. Um, Dr. Krieger. Dr. Krieger on the, uh, oh my God, I can't, I can't believe, I can't remember the name of that show. Well, it'll come to you. Um, yeah, um, I, I'm, it's one of those, uh, just hit a blank, like forgetting someone's name. It'll pop up when the um, movie's It'll over. pop up, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, Lucky Eight's a great comedian and, and voice actor, um, and uh, a guy named Matt Cushing, and uh, the artist, um, Oh my gosh, I'm having the worst memory right now. <laughs> I'm completely spacing. I think I, I freaked on the uh, the show name and now I'm uh, Gideon Kendall uh, is the artist. Oh, I'm, I'm having a uh, that's okay. We're, you're, you're in a no joke. <laughs> we're, we're okay with it. Um, so uh, that's and that book is called Lester of the Lesser Gods. It's it's a pre pretty funny book. Um, it's about a uh, a LARPer who, uh, in the the real world, he is completely um, kind of just mistreated and uh, alone and and not very happy. And then the apocalypse happens. And uh, he finds out that he is uh, one of the many sons of Odin and uh, fights Satan to save the earth. <laughs> is the show Archer? Archer. That's what I meant. Yes. Okay. Uh, could not believe I can't remember that. So, yes, he's Dr. Krieger on Archer. 
it's I had to Google it. So it's, yeah. <laughs> it's not like I had it in my, the back of my brain. I, I've always heard good things about the show, but I've never seen it. So his LARPing prepares him to be a hero of the apocalypse, basically. Yes. Awesome. Yeah. Do you have experience in LARPing or just seeing it? I in don't. Person? I'm just, uh, uh, I guess I'm just, uh, I appreciate those guys for their, their commitment. <laughs> Wait, what? LARPing? The, the LARPing. Yeah, the live action role playing. Yeah. Oh. They'll have like foam swords and capes and costumes. They, there was a group at my college that always fight in the lawn and everything. And we'd walk by <laughs> and kind of like poke fun at them a little bit. But they were definitely really into it and they really enjoyed it. Oh, this is a new thing to me because I'm twice as old <laughs> as Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I don't think it was around back when you were in college in the '80s, Jess. No, I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> um, so before we get into uh, Eddie Gein um, and your writing of that, I I'd, I'd like to gush some more about Hillbilly because <laughs> I just loved this book. Um, I loved your art in it. I loved the writing in it. Um, I it was super imaginative, and um, I'll give the audience the description from the, the back of the first one. Uh, from Eric Powell comes an Appalachian fantasy epic that tells the story of Rondell, a lonely figure who wanders the wooded hills among witches and magical creatures as a folk hero to those who dwell in this gritty fairy tale world. <laughs> um, where, I mean, how long had that idea been bubbling in your head before you actually kind of just put it all pen to paper a few years uh i had all i had been thinking about the the fact that you know most fantasy is set in a kind of uh english setting england it seems like all of the you know sword and sorcery kind of stuff comes from i probably because of tolkien um seems to uh, the the backstory always seems to be kind of uh based on old English mythology. And um, I had the idea that it would be kind of interesting to do a fantasy and basically take Conan and put it in Appalachia. So uh, that was just an acorn of an idea that I had um, for years. And I had a couple of sketches in my sketchbook and always thought um, one day I'm going to get to that you know but i was all really busy with goon stuff so it just kept getting pushed back and back and back and then i kind of got to a stopping point with the goon and um thought well that's the perfect project to do next um so decided to self-publish it and speaking of the goon the books i believe that taylor has are from albatross you got to keep the character mm -hmm. yourself dark horse didn't um didn't own it you got no. to keep you got to keep it and own it yourself mm -hmm. is, is that rare these days or when you're um no the, i mean the creator owned uh comics um m for the most part you're just giving the publisher uh um you know a time a specific either time period or number of publications to to work with you know your concept so uh once your you know agreement is expired you can go wherever you want have you found yourself enjoying just publishing your own comics instead of writing and drawing them and turning them into dark horse like what's been the biggest difference for you there i do enjoy it i, I I enjoy the, the, the extra challenges to it, but also it's, it, it can be exhausting, uh, because you're, you're having to, to do so much more work than, than just, uh, when you have a publisher. So having to, you know, juggle a lot of plates and keep them all spinning. Uh, and sometimes that's, not great because it takes away from the creative aspect of making the books, but I do enjoy it. Do you think we'll ever get like an omnibus version of Hillbilly? Something like this? Uh, we've got some plans for something. Um, obviously there's not, there's, there's not enough material right now to do a series of omnibus. Um, but, uh, 
we've got something coming up that uh, <laughs> will be a, a nice little uh, uh, addition of Hillbilly. Nice. And I'm, not, I'm not just saying this because you're on the show. Like for a small publishing company, this is a really great quality book. Oh, thank great, you. Great paper, really great binding, really well put together. I was really surprised knowing how small you guys are for how great quality this is. So everybody should definitely pick these up. They're great. Yeah, we don't we don't skimp. We try to make the best <laughs> try to make the best product we can. Yeah, Taylor and I are are collected edition collectors, so we mm -hmm. uh, don't have a clue generally what's going on. Right now in the floppy market, we'll find out a year from now when it's mm -hmm. when it's put out and collected. But Taylor, didn't we review a Superman uh, collection recently that had something by Eric in it? Yeah, Escape from Bizarro World was included in the latest uh, Last Son of Krypton hardcover. Right, that was, that was a great story. We huh. loved it. They didn't send me one. <laughs> yeah, so it's you want to see it? <laughs> yeah, the Last Sun Deluxe Edition. It has a couple stories by Jeff Johns and Richard Donner, and then also ends with your story, Escape from Bizarro World. Which yeah. I, I was, I didn't know you had done that, so it was a great surprise to me. Oh, awesome! Yeah, seeing you do a, like a mainstream superhero book is very <laughs> out of the ordinary. I was really <laughs> excited and really surprised to see that. How did that project come about? Um. They just offered it to me. They, uh, at the time, uh, the goon was going pretty strong and there was, uh, uh, the, the zombie craze was just taking off. And I think they had the idea of doing, uh, you know, kind of a more zombie ish take on, uh, the bizarros. Uh, so they thought of me, I guess. Um, <laughs> but yeah, they just, uh, called up and offered it to me and, uh, I was really busy at the time. I was doing the Chinatown uh, graphic novel. Um, so <laughs> I had to think really hard about doing it. I really, I really wanted to do the Superman book because, I mean, it's, you know, he's the most iconic superhero. It would just be nice to say that, you know, even once I worked on Superman. Um, and also to work with uh, Jeff Johns and Richard Donner. Um, so it took me a little while, but I came around and told them I would do it. And then I had to work day and night for, you know, a couple of months. <laughs> yeah. It's hard to think of an artist who's more suited for Bizarro than you. Like you have a really great oh, take on Bizarro. It was and a lot of fun. Planet. It was a lot of fun. I, lo I love drawing Bizarro. Well, speaking of books that maybe are lesser known from your catalog, a book that Jess and I love, and it's really different than the rest of your catalog, is Big Man Plans. <laughs> and this book is out of print, I think. I think it's through Image. It was through Image. Well, uh, it's going to come out again through Albatross. Uh, oh, good. This this winter. I don't so, even know if I can show any pages out. from this book. It's just, there's always it's, something it's going pretty, on. It's pretty over the top. It's pretty it's pretty gruesome. I'm here to rage and get respect. Yeah. <laughs> the biggest difference, I think, in this book compared to others, I, maybe Hillbilly in some ways, but you're usually you're known for your sense of humor infused with brutal violence. But in this one, it's very stark and very dark without right. any humor. And it, was that kind of was that something you did on like really intentionally to make it a lot different than the goon, or just the story kind of did, mandated it? Yeah, we um when we were writing it, uh It got dark real fast <laughs> because you're dealing. I mean, it's the 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 theme of the book is you know uh, how does a marginalized individual um, react to the world you know around them and and uh, and the idea of someone uh, who is marginalized and looked down upon and not considered a threat. What if they were the person that could go into a bar and literally destroy everyone in it? <laughs> so, uh, that's where the, the, it, it started. And then as Tim and I were developing the story, uh, it just got really, really dark and, um, I think to add any humor to that would be, uh, you know, 
if we're doing a story about a marginalized individual to add humor to it would almost distract from that, you know, in a, in a, in a way it would take away from the fact that, you know, we're this, you know, as the tagline you just mentioned says, I'm here to rage and get respect, you know, not, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, be weird to make comedy of that. And also the, uh, there was a lot of, uh, uh, the theme of Pagniacci, even the, uh, um, the t-shirt that he wears, you know, the, um, hang in there. Yeah. And the, the last line, uh, or there's a, there, he scribbles, uh, some graffiti on the wall at the very end of the book. Right. Um, and it, it's, it's an Italian, but it translates to the comedy is over. <laughs> So his his he was a joke his entire life and then the, he ended it you know so um yeah that's the final panel i don't want to show yeah. it to give anything away but yeah that's the final panel yeah yeah my uh, instagram page i reviewed it recently and i said right off the bat i love this book but it's not going to be for everybody <laughs> just for no it. i was telling jess this is probably the darkest book i've ever read i think wow. at least top top three and i'm not complaining i like dark yeah. books I was like, wow, this is a really brutal vision. Do you think yeah. you'll ever come back to this title or do you think it's a one? Uh, we have a follow up. Uh, we just have to um, uh, figure out the timeline to, to make it work. Look at this, Taylor. We're getting all kinds of stuff. There's going to be new goon action figures. There's a follow up to big man plans, possible. Uh, uh, reprint of the Big Man Plans. <laughs> Maybe a hillbilly on this in the future. We're, we're getting the all the stuff that we want. This is great, Eric. This well, is great. <laughs> these are what speculative. Else ask, speculative. What else can we ask for? <laughs> <laughs> um, you do have a new book coming out. Um, uh, did you hear what <laughs> Eddie Gein done? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the famous guy or uh, Gein. he he yeah, his family it? pronounced it Gein. His, Eddie Gein. his family okay. pronounced it Gein. but uh it would if you're going to get technical it would correctly be pronounced guy but i'm going to i'm just going to say what the family used it so it was Gein. but okay yeah so how uh, how what's this one about about i mean is so, it <laughs> I um I was a uh, I'm a big fan of of Harold Schechter who is a uh true crime author. Um is my favorite true crime author. Uh and uh I was driving through uh Wisconsin on a, a book signing tour and you know just driving through some of the stark landscape and uh of course I was familiar with the the story of of Ed Gein and um, I thought uh, it would be great to to it, it would be interesting to do a, a graphic novel, kind of exploring the how you know the isolation that he lived through um, contributed that. It, so for people. Uh, I'm sorry, you just dropped out a little bit. Uh oh. And, and I'm I'm sorry, you you broke oh, okay. up there. You were explaining mm -hmm. who he uh, who he was. Uh, he was a murderer in the the 1950s who did some really bizarre crimes, and uh, he's the basis for Leatherface in Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And uh, James Gum in uh, uh, Silence of the Lambs, or Buffalo Bill in Silence of the Lambs. Um, so uh, I thought it would be interesting to explore that. And this, his isolation in Wisconsin led him to uh, basically uh, dig up graves. And uh, so he had a very and also, he's the basis for uh, Norman Bates and Psycho, which is more closely related than the other characters uh, that have been based on him because he had a, a fixation with his mother 
And when his mother died, he was left alone in this really isolated farmhouse and ended up going to cemeteries and digging up uh, elderly women that reminded him of his mother. He would scan the obituaries and uh, as like replacements for her. Um, really, really bizarre. And he ended up uh, committing a couple of murders. Um, I just thought that explore, like uh, exploring that isolation would be um, interesting in a graphic novel, but uh, Harold Schechter had already done a book on Gein in the 80s, and it, it's phenomenal. Uh, phenomenal. He uh, is pretty much the expert on this case. Um, so I thought, well, there's no point in doing a graphic novel or anything because it's not going to be any better than what he's already done. But a couple of days later, I had the idea like, well, I wonder if I reached out to him, if he would be interested in collaborating on uh, a graphic novel, because there's in, you know, since the 1980s, there's bound to be more evidence and, and you know, facts that he has uh, dug up since then. So I contacted his agent um, with not a lot of hope that anything was going to become of it. And um, much to my surprise, he's a huge comic fan mm. and uh, knew who I was and, and had always actually wanted to do a graphic novel. <laughs> so uh, he, he was all about it. And then uh, we started collaborating and uh, he took my small idea of, of kind of exploring the isolation of, of that and, and turned it into a much bigger uh, exploration of, of, how his crimes affected, you know, the psyche of 1950s America. It was a big story at the time. And it just, you know, in the, the kind of sanitized realm of the 1950s, of course, a guy who is making masks out of human skin and stuff like that is, you know, absolutely shocking. So uh, we, you know, we go a lot into the, uh, Harold had, you know, access to, to his psychological reports and things like that. So we delve really deeply into, you know, how he was created, his, his early family life. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it's, uh, it's, again, it's not, <laughs> it's not a book that's for everyone. Someone, uh, actually I was promoting it on Facebook and someone said, you know, I love your work, but I don't, I'm not into books about, you know, serial killers and stuff. And I said, you know, just be aware, this is not a glorification of him or his crimes. This is, you know, an examination of what led to this person. Uh, but, it, but the book, but that's okay. If you don't want to get it, it's not for everybody, you know? So, uh, you have to, to, uh, be into the true crime genre for this one. There's a lot of people into the true crime genre right now. There's so many true crime podcasts, right. so many Netflix shows. There definitely is a big market for this. For those of us who can stomach this book, when will it be coming out? I don't, the exact, I don't know the exact date off the top of my head. Okay. Did I freeze I again? In yeah, sorry. I think it's sometime yeah, in July. I think it's, I saw it's coming out. <laughs> So, but you did yeah, find a big portion. Uh, it's it's of actually the August. I think mid August. Oh. oh, okay. Sorry. Mid August. So it's coming up soon. I know that you did fund a big portion of this project through Kickstarter. What led to that decision to go the Kickstarter route? Uh, we had seen a lot of people raise a lot of money on there. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's basically it. Uh, again, you know, like you're saying, our, our the the production value on our stuff, we, we want to keep it, you know, really nice. And for this book, I knew it was going to be special. And, uh, I wanted to, the, the book to be, you know, a really nice hardcover. Um, and that's, that's a, a substantial out of pocket cost to do something like that, do a really high end, uh, hardcover. So, uh, I thought this would be a good, time to do our first Kickstarter to make sure that we could produce the book that we wanted to. 
But the good thing is that, you know, those who do the Kickstarter can get their book, but even those who didn't do the Kickstarter, it's still going to be in the direct market and you can still buy it, even if you didn't back the Kickstarter. Right. And the, the Kickstarter is only for a signed uh, special edition. The um, We didn't offer the regular book stand edition through the Kickstarter because we wanted to, you know, we didn't want to undercut uh, bookshops and, and uh, comic shops. Uh, so we actually did a slip case. Uh, one of the incentives for the uh, Kickstarter was a slip case that um, has an extra slot in it for the newsstand edition. So if you got the slip case on the Kickstarter, you still have to go to a, a shop and buy the regular edition to fill up the slip case. Mm. I wish I had known about the Kickstarter. It seems like I always <laughs> find out about Kickstarters too late. I didn't even know until Taylor told me about it, that it was a Kickstarter and I buy a lot of Kickstarter stuff. Yeah. They come and go fast. Yeah, they do. So it was, it, it must've been funded fairly quickly then. Yeah, we, we were funded, uh, in 24 hours. So wow. that's good. First day. Um, and, uh, yeah, I was really happy with the response. I sent, I, I set a personal goal of, of what I wanted to, to reach. And we hit that. So I was really happy with it. Are you, make, Oh, sorry, Jess, keep going. Okay. Sorry. Um, are you going to be going out now that we've reached a teeny bit of normalcy? Uh, <laughs> people are vaccinated. Um, most people, uh, I, I would guess have, uh, have gotten the vaccination and we don't have as many hot spots as we had, do you feel like you can go out and promote this at cons in the fall or, or are you going to wait till next year? I think, I think I'm going to wait till next year to do a, any cons, but um, I do want to maybe do some small signing events. Um, we're looking into that. Um, but I think I'm going to wait till next year to do a uh, convention. Um, if, if you happen to want to go to Annapolis, Maryland, Third Eye Comics is my LCS, and they're awesome with signings. If you oh, want yeah? to just keep that in mind. Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> I would definitely come to that. What were you going to say, Taylor? Oh, well, it sounds like you had a great Kickstarter experience. Has this led you to want to do this again in the future at some point? To do more Kickstarters? I think, yeah, I think we're going to do some more. Um, it just it made it so easy. I mean, usually like with the the omnibus books, that was a major out of pocket expense uh, to do. You know, five giant books like that, and uh, it's stressful because you you know like you're not making that money back when the the book goes on sale. You know, for the most part, you have to wait for it to be. You know, because you you print more than you know your initial orders. So your, your printing costs are pretty high. Um, with this, the, the game book, uh, we had all of the money to uh, pay for the printing and the production right off the bat. So uh, a lot less stressful and uh, a lot less pressure. Um, so uh, uh, I want to find ways to make sure we can do it and not um, hinder any of the retailers, uh, while doing it. But, um, for small independent guys like me, it doesn't seem to, to make much of a ripple at all. Well, it and, definitely makes sense why you didn't want to try to reprint library editions through your imprint. Cause that would be even <laughs> a major cost to try to do that. Those books are massive and you could really kill yeah. somebody with them. Well, also they had, they had already been done and, uh, to have, yeah, big hardcover. Uh, the idea of... We, we wanted to make sure that all the goon material was still out there when we moved from Dark Horse to, to Albatross. Um, and I thought it would be a good idea to, to make more affordable uh, versions, you know, of the old material, but not have 20 trade paperbacks out there because it just becomes kind of monotonous and, and it's kind of a deterrent for people when, you know, they see there's that much volume out there 
it's like where do you jump in right um so i thought five omnibus books would be a good you know a good number and you have a great title it says the goon omnibus volume one bunch of old crap and it yeah. goes the same for all five of them i love that title i couldn't I, I think of anything more appropriate i was like well you know what is this it's all the old crap we'll just call it a bunch of old crap <laughs> well, that fits so well for the humor of the goon. It was perfectly titled. Yeah. <laughs> and I just finished my goon readathon, read all five books. And I oh, was just really amazed how over the course of 20 years, you kept it so fresh that there's no arc that's just like the one before. Every arc is so different. Like some like Chinatown, there's no humor. It's really dark. And there's mm -hmm. some, it's just slapstick comedy. So how, like, like, how do you think you were able to make it so fresh for so long? And you're still even publishing it now. Well, I think... Um... I think I was um, just uh, keeping myself entertained, I think, is the key to that. Mm. Um, I all, From the very beginning, uh, I always looked at the goon as uh, a way to, um, you know, do whatever I wanted to do. And uh, with, you know, as, t as time went on, you know, I had to change it up for myself just to stay interested and not, uh, not so, you know, keep it where it wouldn't feel stale to me. Uh, so a lot of the art style changes from even issue to issue just because I wanted to experiment or try something else. And um, the stories go back and forth with you know, my mood and what I wanted to write at the time. Um, you know, sometimes the stories would get really dark and then they would go really goofy. And, uh, you know, I think, yeah, it was just all about <laughs> selfishly keeping my myself entertained. Well, you could definitely tell that you're like flexing your muscles and trying to work out your art because it's so you challenge yourself almost every issue. And even within issues, you'll have like three different art styles. So do you think that really helped make you a better artist and push you to be better by constantly changing? Uh, I, I don't think that necessarily helped me become a better artist. I think those were the steps I was, uh, the, the experimentation uh, were, were attempts to become better. Um, I think that's what it was all about. I mean, every issue was like, you know, uh, early on, you can kind of see where I started using uh, pencil and washes and stuff, and um, uh, that was just you know me going, huh? I wonder if, what it would look if I took a Prismacolor pencil and kind of shaded out here instead of feathering with the brush. And um, sorry, I'm being swarmed by flies. Uh, <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, it was all just, you know, me trying to do different things and, and seeing, you know, how I like it. And I, I still go back and forth, you know, like, do I want to do more line work or do I want to do, you know, pencil and washes? And, you know, it's all, you know, a big experiment. Yeah, because I noticed the uh, when you say washes and stuff, uh, Hillbilly um, has... Uh, some of the same art style as uh, uh, the goon, but then it, there are other uh, panels that seem to be uh, completely different. And I mean, you even uh, experiment with color. Uh, I don't know, not experiment, but you you throw in color changes uh, to emphasize characters right. in it. Um, and I noticed um right away that while it had uh goon style art elements it seemed hillbilly to me seemed to be uh, uh a completely different type of uh not style but it it had uh different it was different in its presentation than the goon mm -hmm. yeah i uh, I wish I could go back and, and do Hillbilly a little differently. I think I, I wish I could have. I, I think uh, in some of the later issues, I did. Uh, I think actually in the free comic book day that came out was the last thing that came out um, of Hillbilly. Uh, I did the whole book in 
pencil or a lot of it in pencil with some washes. And I wish I had done the book that way from the beginning. Um, just really rough textures and, uh, you know, just do the book in black and white with really rough, you know, textured pencil work and, and washes to, to add tones. Um, but yeah, it's, I always tend to, um, like you were saying with the color, uh, try to, to alter the art style or the color or whatever to fit a certain tone or mood. And, you know, if, if, you know, something needs to seem, you know, a, a little bit more crisp and clean, then usually it's just, you know, cr you know, more crisp line work and, and pretty standard colors. And then, you know, if I'm trying to set a mood, like, you know, the, the fight scene you just showed in Hillbilly, you know, the, be a little bit more, you know, dramatic with, you know, uh, the color and, and um, uh, just to set that tone and, and make the reader have an emotional feeling about, you know, something kind of direct them in the way that I want to, to them to go. Mm -hmm. Do you think there could ever be a goon hillbilly crossover? Or maybe there has been one and I haven't noticed, noticed it. I'm sorry you froze up there at the end. What was oh, the, the sorry about that. The end of your question. Said, do, you, do you think there'll ever be a hillbilly goon crossover? Maybe there already is one. I just wasn't aware of it. I think the closest we're going to get, uh, the buzzard uh, made an appearance in, I think, hillbilly number two. Um, I think that's the closest we're going to get, just because they're. Uh, I want to keep them kind of separate, separate worlds, but. Um, uh, Buzzard, uh, the last time we saw him in the goon, he kind of became like the embodiment of the embodiment of death, kind of like the the Grim Reaper. So I felt like it was okay to have him kind of walking between worlds and and also uh, being that kind of death character in in Hillbilly. So you don't really have like an Eric Powell shared universe; they're all kind of their own separate things for the most part. Not necessarily. There, there are little things that I've I've hinted at to connect uh, some books, and I'm surprised that more people haven't picked up on them. <laughs> uh oh, I did little things like I missed some things. <laughs> <laughs> I did really like the Hellboy Goon crossover. That was oh, really thanks. cool. That was really funny. Yeah, that I was fun. Well, I'll have to go back and see if I can catch anything on the second read through at some point. <laughs> um, what um, do you um, when you have to, today? You told me you've been doing a lot of yard work. Mm -hmm. Is when you sit down to create, uh, what kind of uh, uh, a setup do you have? Is it a do you have a dedicated room where and you work in silence or do you like music or anything on in the background? Yeah, when I'm uh, when I'm writing, I have to, it has to be silent or uh, I, I actually put on uh, a lot of soundtracks, anything that doesn't have vocals, because right. if I start listening to anything where someone is talking, it's like trying to do math and someone shouting numbers at you, you know, <laughs> that's uh uh, I know Andrea is probably gets frustrated with me sometimes because I, I get a little irritable, but it's like when I'm trying to like write something and she'll ask me a perfectly, you know, reasonable question. And I'll be like, I don't know. Don't talk to me right now. <laughs> uh, just because of that. Cause it, it, it really is that that's the closest comparison I can make. It's like trying to do math while someone is shouting numbers at you. Um, so I need, I don't or just instrumental music. And, uh, okay. Did we freeze up there? Yes, a little bit. A little bit, but we got sorry, most of what you said. freeze up a little bit. Yeah. Uh, okay. But we we so got most. I was of saying yeah. 
Okay. That seems to be yeah, common. I have a Yeah. Go ahead. I have a, a a studio space that I, you know, do all the artwork in and um with that it's I I like as much you know uh <laughs> It's the exact opposite of writing. I want, you know, anything, an audio book, uh, music. Sometimes I'll put on uh, movies that I've watched before just because it's dialogue, you know. Um, I don't put on anything that I haven't seen because I'll, I'll keep looking up from the table to watch the movie. Mm -hmm. But if it's a movie I really like and I like the dialogue in it, sometimes I'll put it on just as background. Um, but I listen to a ton of audio books when I'm drawing, uh, just anything that will help keep me in the chair. <laughs> right. Um, Taylor, I'll give you the honor of asking our favorite question. Do you, are you, are we mind melding? You know what I'm thinking? <laughs> our favorite question. Is it one of our wrap up questions? Uh, yeah. Um, why don't, you, why don't you ask it then, Jess? Because I'm not sure exactly which question you mean. No, it's a no. It's our favorite question. <laughs> you're, you're reading my mind. We're a team. Come on. What is about what he collects? Is that what it is? That is exactly. All right. So as you can tell, <laughs> Jess and I are pretty avid collectors. Him even more so than I. He has a lot more stuff than I do. Is there anything you collect in particular? It doesn't have to be comics or anything related to that. But is there anything you collect in your office or? A while ago, I started. A while ago, I started collecting antique wrenches, and then I stopped because I had a bucket full of wrenches. <laughs> and then, so what do you do with it? Yeah, what do you do with it? It's uh, not a reference for the goon because the goon likes to use wrenches. To yeah, what's zombie. great is I found like some little, like maybe six or seven inch antique wrenches, and they're perfectly to scale, but they're tiny and have little wooden handles, and they're great old wrenches. I don't know when they were made. They're pretty old, but uh, I keep uh, one of those by the table to use as reference for the goon. <laughs> um, well, you're, you're definitely the first creator to tell us that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I also, uh, I collect a lot of art books. Um, you know, uh, just artists that I like. Um, a lot of illustration books, things like that. Who, I know, uh, oh, sorry, Jess. No, go ahead. My question was totally off the wall. Okay. Yeah. So the one thing I really want to hear from you, especially being more of an indie creator, having your own publishing company, what do you think about the way that, what do you think about the comic industry as it is in 2021? And how would you kind of like to see it change or evolve in the next couple of years? Do you have any thoughts about that? We're freezing up again. <clears throat> can you hear me? Yeah, now we can. Hear you. Yeah, sorry about that. That's all right. Okay. <laughs> all right, the comic industry. Um, I think it's the same uh, way <laughs> I've wanted it to change since uh, I started in comics, you know, decades ago. Um, I, I wish we could uh, be seen more as a a viable entertainment um, industry rather than just uh, a superhero factory. Um, I grew up a Marvel kid. I still love all those characters, um, but uh, I don't want us to be seen as just superheroes there's so much other material being made out there and i think if we could break that stigma of only being superheroes i mean you know we could expand uh we could stop shrinking and start growing you know mm. uh if we could appeal to average you know readers that you know read true crime or romance or you know science fiction drama whatever every genre uh, I it, it would just be a lot better for our art form and our industry if we could do that. But is that going to happen? I don't know. I've been waiting for it to happen for you know a few decades now, and we're still you know mainly known as as 
uh, superhero material. Yeah, I think people have to break out of that idea, which the mass audience does. I mean, the mass amount of people out there think that comics are a genre, not a medium. It's right. just one thing. It's no, it's mm-hmm. it's everything. It's like movies, it's like TV shows. There can be a bunch of different stuff happening there. But for some yeah. reason, people stigmatize you know stigmatize comics as just superheroes. Yeah, and I like like you said, we love superheroes, but I mm-hmm. would definitely be burned out all that stuff if I couldn't read books like yours, image books. We need your books and other books like yours to keep this industry alive. Mm-hmm. So we really do appreciate all the work that you're doing, and we'll keep yeah. doing for well, the next several years. Thank you, I appreciate it. Trying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you are. This is. Uh, been an interview that's a, like a labor of love because we are two of your biggest fans and um, well, thank you. We genuinely love the stuff you put out. Um, is is there anything in closing that we didn't touch on that y- you've um, been wanting to say? Um, uh, I I know. Uh, uh, how how do people find out about your uh, projects, your new projects? Are you um, uh, uh, on social media at all, or do you have a, a newsletter? Yeah, uh, they can go to albatrossfunnybooks.com, and it has links to all of our social media and our newsletter and all that good stuff in one spot. <laughs> I'll put that in the description for sure. Cool. I'll put a link for it in the description. Because uh, I know we want to keep up with your stuff, and, and, and I know your fans definitely do. Uh, I, I'm i just thrilled that we got to talk to you, and I, I genuinely appreciate all the time you've given us. I, I wish you continued success. Um, I hope all your dreams come true, because that means my dreams will come true, <laughs> like more goon figures and any kind of <laughs> cartoons or anything that can happen, animation hillbilly omnibuses, whatever. It all <laughs> helps me as a collector and fan. Well, thank you guys so much for having me on here and also for promoting my stuff. You know, you guys being out there, you know, uh, reviewing my material and everything that it really helps. It does. Yeah. So your, 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 ne- your next book, which we already talked about, did you hear what Eddie Gein done? That's coming out, I think a month, month and a half from now, somewhere mm-hmm. late July, early August, somewhere mm-hmm. there. So definitely keep your eyes peeled for that book, everybody. It sounds like it's going to be a a big one for us crime fans. Yeah. If you love true crime, you're going to be into this book. (laughs) Well, we have a show called Crime Corner, and it sounds like we'll be definitely talking about it. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Everybody out there, uh, please go to albatrossbooks.com and thank you for watching. We appreciate uh, every, every fan and every viewer that we get. So please hit the like button, subscribe and comment. And uh, the Minister of Comics IG, will uh, Instagram address will be in the description as well as mine. And peace and love, peace and love. Thank you so much for watching.